Hello, welcome. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. This is webinar number three of our fall e-bike series. We have teamed up with professionals to help us address best practices when it comes to uh, e-bikes, safe storage, and handing, uh, handling of lithium-ion batteries is today's topic. I'm joined here by my good friend, my colleague, Mike Fritz from Human Powered Solutions. Human Powered Solutions and the MBDA has been working extremely close for the past year on updating the industry, keeping the industry advised on e-bikes. Um, and as we've noticed, the number of incidents has rapidly increased with our retailers and at consumers. Um, and we're seeing the press, the news is just an abundance. And we wanna make sure all of our retailers, our whole industry at large is up to date and, and aware of what's happening and how we can best protect our retail environments, our industry and riders at large. Earlier this year, uh, we attended a symposium in New York City with the uh, New York City Fire Department. We, MBDA and Human Powered Solutions were the only people in attendance from the bicycle industry. And I can tell you firsthand what we learned uh, over the course of that two day event uh, left me forever changed and uh, definitely gave us the fuel we needed to continue forward with these important updates. So today's event will be recorded. It will be available on YouTube following. Um, so we urge you to share with staff and review it again. Uh, for all those in attendance today, we are going to save questions to the end. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat function along the way. At the conclusion of Mike's presentation, we will moderate those and make sure we have a chance to answer any of your questions. Please keep yourself on mute if you would as the presentation uh, moves forward. And I think that's it from our side. I'm going to turn it over to, to Mike Fritz now, Human Powered Solutions. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Heather. And um, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, and thank you for everybody that's participating. Um, I think most of you probably know who I am, but just a real quick uh, intro. I'm, I'm Mike Fritz. I'm a, the Chief Technology Officer at Human Powered Solutions. We're a consultancy in the micromobility area. Um, myself and my partners have uh, extensive experience in the in the bicycle and e-bike bi uh, bicycle industry. Um, uh, more more experience than I care to share because uh, we've been doing this a long time. I personally have been involved in e-bikes and e-bike technologies for the last 25 years. Uh, I've got a particular focus on e-bike propulsion systems and lithium-ion batteries in particular. And uh, as you're probably aware, there are issues associated with lithium-ion batteries, and we want to be your source for competent advice relative to how to minimize any risks that you or your customers might encounter uh, with these incredible devices. Um, uh, without further ado, I'll just get into it. What I'd like to do initially is share with you a situation uh, that is developed, um, as, as this slide implies, much has transpired since our last webinar, and we plan on bringing you up to speed with respect to uh, some very unfortunate incidents that are occurring that we're concerned are going to cast a bad light on our industry and what we're doing uh, proactively to try to address it. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the technology behind this issue and why the guidance that we offer to you is effective in mitigating any risks. And then I'll review the various policies and procedures and advice that we've given in our previous webinars to help you and your customers minimize the chances of ever having an unpleasant experience with, uh, with these remarkable um, e-bikes. Um, getting into it, as you may be aware, there's a very, very a dire situation transpiring in New York City right now. Um, uh, Consumer Reports just, or I'm sorry, National Public Radio just reported last week um, uh, the fact that there are, they're, they're saying four times a week on average, an e-bike or an e-scooter battery catches fire in New York City. Uh, very sadly, there have been 174 this year alone. It's uh, on, a, on a pace to more than uh, double this year as opposed to last year. Um, very tragically, six people have died uh, associated with these, these lithium ion batteries and 93 have been injured. Um, it's a very dire situation. Uh, we, we believe we understand the causes behind it. I'll go into that in a little, little bit of detail. Uh, we're taking some proactive action and from our perspective, from the industry perspective, uh, uh, that hopefully will, will help mitigate the situation and, and reduce these occurrences. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. 
Again, as, as Heather mentioned, uh, the New York City Fire Department uh, sponsored a symposium back in September on micromobility fires. They see this as such a significant issue in New York City that they pulled together this two-day symposium uh, and invited firefighters from across the country. And uh, I think the fact that it was extremely well attended, um, fortunately, we got in, the, 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 the symposium was fully booked. We managed, we have contacts at Underwriters Laboratories that managed to get us in. And as Heather, Heather said, we were the only representatives of the bicycle and e-bikes uh, 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 industry in attendance at the uh, symposium. We, we learned a lot. Um, it confirmed a lot of what we had suspected relative to this. Uh, we had an opportunity to rub elbows with the guys that have to deal with these things on a regular basis. Uh, and it was quite a, an eye-opening experience. Um, Chief Joe Loftus of uh, FDNY is, is the battalion commander for the Hazmat Battalion uh, in New York City. And he made the statement several times during the course of the symposium that lithium ion batteries have changed the game for firefighters. What he was alluding to was the fact that lithium ion battery fires are significantly different from any types of other fires that they've experienced in the past. Lithium ion batteries burn hotter, um, they burn longer, uh, they can reignite spontaneously, uh, they're extremely difficult to extinguish, and they represent a significant hazard not only to consumers that are uh, involved in these fires, but also the firefighters that have to put them out. So. Um, it really underscored the importance of, of uh, awareness of this issue and the importance of taking proper steps to minimize the possibility that this will ever occur. Now, that said, we believe there are a number of factors that, that aggravate the situation in New York City, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And uh, the, the, the good news associated with this is that we believe that the batteries that are catching fire in New York City are of a lesser quality or lesser grade, if you will, than the battery packs that you guys deal with, with uh, uh, independent bicycle dealer quality e-bikes that you're selling. But again, we'll, we'll revisit that in a little bit more detail a little bit later in the program. Uh, the situation is not unique to New York City. Other major metropolitan areas, both in North America as well as around the world, are seeing similar issues. And, and again, we believe it's due to the fact that substandard battery packs are involved. Uh, low cost battery packs, battery packs that have not been tested and certified to um, uh, standards and regulations that are being promulgated associated with the construction and quality of the packs that are manufactured. Uh, and that's exacerbating this problem. <clears throat> Again, a little, a little bit more on that a little bit later. And finally, the, the, the big concern from our perspective is the fact that it's, it's really casting a negative light on e-bikes as a product. And we're very concerned about that. This is this, electric bikes are a fabulous product. They they represent significant benefit to society, given their cleanliness and and the utility uh, as a personal transportation vehicle. And we don't want anything to hinder the the uh, adoption or the promulgation of electric bicycles in society. And we're quite concerned that that um, articles like this uh, that are appearing regularly in major uh, news outlets are, are basically going to uh, give consumers the impression that <clears throat> the, the dangers associated with these lithium ion batteries make e-bikes more hazardous than they're worth. And nothing could be further from the truth. There's, there's a lot of reasons for why um, lithium ion battery packs are safe and reliable for their intended use, assuming A, that they're quality packs to begin with, and B, that they're properly managed in, in service and in, in, uh, in use, and we'll go into that. Visibility uh, of, of these fires is obvious. Um, when you look at the, the types of reporting that we just alluded to, major governmental agencies are taking notice. And um, obviously the fire department in New York City, the fire marshal, the FDNY fire marshal is the guy that influences code setting in New York. And there's conversations now about the possibility of banning electric bikes again. That would be horrible news for the industry and not to mention the, the consumers and the people that enjoy the utility of e-bikes in New York City. The National Fire Protection Agency is taking notice. Again, as FDNY 
uh, pointed out during the course of that symposium, these fires are significantly more hazardous than anything else that they've been used to doing, um, used to, to, to dealing with in terms of fires in structures and residences and whatnot. And uh, that's really got fire departments uh, concerned because of the dangers associated with it. Clearly the New York City Council, we've been in touch with representatives of the New York City Council relative to this. Those people, obviously they wanna manage their city and they wanna do everything that they can to make sure that their citizens are safe, uh, both in their homes and in um, the, their transportation utilization. And even the US Senate, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, appeared in New York City along with the mayor talking about the fact that in an effort to, to mitigate the danger of these battery fires, they're actually converting old newsstands, uh, newsstands on the corners in, in New York that have gone obsolete because of uh, everybody gets their news media over the uh, internet now, but they're converting these old newsstands into charging stations so that the bikes are, are isolated while they're being charged. And you know, they're not in uh, a living environment and they're not, they're in a place where if a fire occurs, it can be more easily dealt with. Our perspective on this is, is rather than try to address um, a fire once it happens, we, we would like to uh, take a more proactive approach and uh, prevent the fire in the first place. And we'll get into that in a little bit. The uh, NBDA and, is, and Human Part Solutions, as Heather alluded, we're collaborating with a number of public and private agencies in an, in an effort to A, raise awareness of these issues that people do, so that people do adopt the guidelines that we pr propose, but also in terms of identifying the core problems. In, an, in other words, what is it about these battery packs that make them so risky, so prone to failure? And how can we, how can we address that? And these various agencies are, are quite capable. Obviously, uh, we've been working with underwriters laboratories. They've published safety standards uh, that are currently voluntary that we're lobbying should become mandatory. Uh, Fire Department of New York City, clearly they have a role to play. Uh, recycling is a big issue. And as you're aware, People for Bikes has sponsored a, a program in conjunction with Call to Recycle to deal with batteries, battery packs as they re, uh, reach the end of their life in terms of their service life, but also what to do with potentially uh, dangerous battery packs that have been damaged in use um, or by floods, such that we saw in Florida several weeks ago due to Hurricane Ivan or Ian. And um, energy storage safety products. One of the things that we've been talking about, and it's an underlying theme for these webinars, is how do you safely store lithium ion batteries in your shop, in your home, um, uh, in, a, in a commercial environment, for example. Uh, these people are looking very carefully at, at the design of storage systems <clears throat> that will uh, manage lithium ion batteries such that if an unfortunate event does occur, it's, it's handled <clears throat> in a safe and appropriate fashion. Los Deliveratis Unidos is the union that's been formed uh, in New York City that represents the e-bike delivery messengers. Uh, they're quite an effective force. Uh, we're, we're talking literally tens of thousands of people that are employed in um, delivery services, be it either food or packages um, uh, that use these e-bikes on a regular basis. Generally speaking, these guys are not affluent. Um, they have to buy low cost product and we think that's one of the issues that needs to be addressed. Currently, we're in the process of pulling together a consortium of concerned parties uh, that would include all of these players to meet and discuss means of addressing this problem proactively in New York City. NBDA and Human Powered Solutions will be a part of this group moving forward. We're anticipating um, a meeting forming this group sometime in December uh, so that we can get to work on, on uh, developing effective uh, remedial action associated with these problems. Why is this happening? <clears throat> this is, this is my theory right now. I obviously I've been involved with with lithium ion batteries since their inception for uh, micro mobility applications back in the early 2000s. Um, I've been studying the situation very carefully. Obviously, I've worked with a lot of uh, qualified experts in this field. <clears throat> I'm a little bit frustrated right now because we haven't had the opportunity nor the support necessary to validate this theory. So I emphasize that it's a theory, but I think it's a it's a learned theory. I think it's a valid theory, and we're working very hard to uh, to to prove it. Um, my theory is that these low cost e bikes are being supplied with substandard battery packs. 
again, as I mentioned, the delivery riders in New York City can't afford a, a three or four thousand dollar electric bike to to uh, uh, achieve their purpose. Uh, so they they buy inexpensive bikes, less than thousand dollar bikes. And when you consider the the fact that a quality safe battery pack at an original equipment cost of about two hundred and seventy five to three hundred dollars. If you're buying a bike for less than $1,000 at retail, there's nowhere near that much money being invested in a safe battery pack. So it's our concern that these packs are being manufactured with substandard cells and with substandard battery management systems that are in effect failing during the course of service and, and resulting in this problem. There are many, many battery packs in circulation in New York City supporting this, this industry, if you will, these, these um, uh, e-bike messengers. Uh, oftentimes, we believe that they're being charged with incompatible chargers. Uh, when you've got that many battery packs that are being used constantly on a daily basis, you know, you look for any way that you can to restore the charge to that battery pack so you can work eight or 10 or 12 hours, whatever it might be. Um, most of these people live in, in uh, tenements, the high rises in New York City, because they can't afford uh, better housing than that. And they have no place to store their bike at the end of the workday. So what do they do? They bring it up and they put it in their apartment. If they don't, it'll get stolen or vandalized. So while it's in their apartment, because they need it to be fully charged the next day, they're plugging in the chargers and going to bed. Oftentimes they park the, the bike adjacent to the front door for easy uh, uh, in and out. And if that battery catches fire during the course of the night, it blocks egress from the apartment and, and injuries and fatalities occur and they get a lot of publicity. These um, delivery riders also, we're, we suspect, are replacing their end of life battery packs. When these packs are used up, they do have a, a useful life. They're replacing those packs with cheap packs that they can buy online from Alibaba or Amazon.com. The cost of a good uh, replacement battery pack for a dealer level uh, electric bicycle is, is between eight and nine hundred dollars, and these people can't afford that. Uh, it's, it's just too much money, so they're they're buying the cheapest they can. Oftentimes, they're sending their packs off to be refurbished. There's a, a cottage industry that has sprouted up where people will take a, a battery pack that's reached the end of, the, of its useful life. They'll open it up. They'll extract the ex, uh, expended cells and they'll try replacing it with cells that they've purchased online uh, from questionable sources. Uh, what they don't do is they don't reprogram the battery management system. They don't balance the cells before they're soldering them into a, the, the serial parallel matrix. And, and the bottom line is, is that's suddenly now a ticking time bomb because it's not been properly constructed with proper materials, but it's going back into commerce because they're using it on a daily basis. And, and uh, I have to be careful with the term ticking time bomb, but I do feel that in fact it is because sooner or later that pack is going to fail and it's going to fail in a catastrophic fashion. <clears throat> As I say, this represents what I call a perfect storm leading to catastrophic failures with predictable consequences. We think that this is the issue. This is not a problem that the independent bicycle dealer quality bike e-bike has because we're using quality, quality battery packs that are constructed uh, with good materials and they're properly programmed and whatnot. So what we, what we wanna do, we've, we've made a proposal and we've submitted this proposal to the uh, uh, New York City Fire Department. We've submitted it to the city council. And basically what it says is, Let's go out and obtain samples of these battery packs from the retail outlets that sell them to the messengers. And let's take those battery packs and compare them with sample packs from IBD quality bikes to see whether or not the construction methods are substandard. What we want to do most importantly is we want to test these sample packs to the UL 2271 requirements. UL 2271 is the standard that UL has promulgated in cooperation with the, with the, uh, the industry to certify battery packs to make sure that they're properly designed, constructed, manufactured from quality materials, especially quality battery cells, so that they can offer safe um, uh, service during the course of their, their useful life. We, what we wanna do then is we wanna, uh, if in fact we discover that these battery packs are defective, either they don't comply with 2271 or the construction is shoddy, we wanna work with the Consumer Product Safety Commission to recall those suspect battery packs. CPSC is charged with protecting the safety of US citizens. They have uh, authority under, under the Consumer Product Safety Act to identify and recall hazardous products. You read about it every day, be it a baby crib or a, a television set or whatever. We want to impress upon CPSC that not all battery packs are dangerous. 
that there is a population of battery packs out there that are causing significant problems, primarily in New York City, but in other metropolitan areas as well. And we want them to exercise their authority under the Consumer Product Safety Act to recall those packs and get them out of, uh, out of uh, circulation. What we, what we don't want to do is we don't want to cripple, we don't want to hinder this industry. We don't want these bicycle messengers that rely on their e-bikes for their living, for their ability to put food on the table, to suddenly be taken away. So it's our proposal that we would collaborate with quality battery pack manufacturers to develop safe and reliable replacement packs that we can then offer to these e-bike messengers that have had their battery packs taken away because the ones that they use are dangerous. And what we, we don't want to do also is we want to be able to offer them some support in this because again, if a quality battery pack costs $800, they can't afford that. There needs to be some sort of a subsidy offered to these people such that they can replace that battery pack at a reasonable price. And the cost of the pack, we want to be subsidized by, by governmental agencies because the benefit obviously to taking dangerous packs out of the marketplace and replacing them with safe packs is obvious. You know, let's stop these fires. Let's stop this, 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 the danger that's presented to these people. Um, let's stop the danger to the, to the firefighters that have to deal with these fires once they do occur. And we think that's a legitimate way of going about it. However, this, is, this, this proposal has cost. And right now, nobody is stepping up at this juncture to help us fund this. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's expensive to, to collect samples and to submit them to agencies for testing and whatnot. So this is current. This is obviously going to be on the table when we convene this, um, uh, this consortium of involved parties in New York City to see if we can uh, get this um, acted upon. And again, our motivation is the fact that, that we believe that this situation represents a real hazard to our industry. Uh, a lot of our colleagues in the industry basically look at the situation in New York City and go, well, that's not my problem. It's not my bikes that are catching fire. It's, it's uh, you know, those are substandard, substandard batteries from cheap importers that really aren't being very responsible in terms of the product that they distribute. And we beg to disagree. It is our problem. Consumers don't differentiate between cheap bikes and expensive bikes. They don't care that it's a you know, $1,000 bike as opposed to a $6,000 bike. Um, the, the, the concern that we have is that this is going to cast a pall over the entire industry and it's going to hinder and, and cripple our efforts to, to proliferate this incredible um, technology that we've developed that's, that's safe when it's proper in its, uh, in its manufacturing design and use. So um, fortunately, we've got the support of NBDA. NBDA carries a lot of weight. Heather was invited to speak on the panel at the fire department symposium. Uh, she did an excellent job of relaying to the rest of the uh, firefighting community across our country because it was very well attended by fire, fire departments across the country. And uh, we, have a, we have a stake in this and, and we can't ignore what's happening. So uh, fortunately through Heather's efforts and our efforts, we're trying to raise awareness and we're trying to take proactive action to, to mitigate the situation. How can IBDs assist? We need your help. We need your help um, in a very important way. One of the things, one of the, one of the aspects of that proposal that I laid out is we want to prove that bikes uh, that are sold with quality battery packs through independent bicycle dealers are in fact safe. And we do know, however, that a lot of bike dealers have experienced issues with their lithium ion batteries. We need to know more about that. Uh, we, we submitted a survey earlier this year uh, that really opened our eyes to the fact that these things are failing in bike shops more often than we thought. We need to know how, we need to know why. So what we're asking, we've, we've recrafted our survey and recirculated it. Uh, it's my intention that as the survey results come in, that if a shop has experienced a problem with a battery, I will call that shop and I will interview the owner or the mechanic uh, you know, that has the most insight into, into what transpired so that we can better understand where the battery came from, what were the circumstances under which it failed? What was its service life up, to, up until that point? Because this is going to allow us to make that argument that, that battery packs, quality battery packs are not so subject to this problem. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to mistakenly go out and say that a quality battery pack never fails because in fact, that's not the case. So we need to know more about what transpires in your shop. 
so that we can better represent the situation from the industry perspective as we carry this effort forth uh, in terms of addressing the situation. So please respond to the latest NBDA dealer survey on your experience with battery packs. And again, as that information comes in, I will follow up, find out the details associated with the incident so that we can learn more and we can better make our case with good data, with actual um, experience that you've reported to us through this survey as we move this project forward. What does this whole situation mean for our industry? Um, you know, as, as I've said, what we don't want to do is we don't want there to be the perception that lithium ion batteries that power our e-bikes are un, un, unreasonable. They present an unreasonable risk to e-bike dealers and consumers. Is that really the case? And I contend that no, it's not the case. I contend that quality battery packs properly stored, used, charged, and maintained are safe and reliable for their intended use. Um, it's, it's obvious that lithium ion batteries are becoming a, an energy supply for a whole host of problems. And there have been a number of issues in other industries, laptop computers, clearly car batteries fail from time to time. Um, but we need to better understand exactly why these failures occur so that we can address them. Now, the very good news, as I've reported earlier, is the fact that there's new technologies on the horizon that are going to address the situation from a, a scientific perspective, if you will. Uh, solid state lithium ion batteries are currently in development. Solid state lithium ion batteries eliminate the flammable portion of a uh, lithium ion cell. It's the electrolyte that causes the problem. The electrolyte is very flammable. It needs to be based on its function. And, and it has a very low flash point. And again, without going into a lot of the detail on it, um, if that electrolyte is heated up beyond its flash point, it will ignite. And when it ignites, it ignites in a dramatic fashion and it causes lots of problems. But we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. The, the other question that's on the table, as I've alluded with respect to the survey, can a quality battery pack fail? Can a well-constructed, tested, certified battery pack fail? Yes, it can. Under certain circumstances, it can fail. But that's why we've developed a list of procedures and processes to eliminate it. Uh, quality battery packs fail very, very rarely. And nowhere near the frequency is what we're seeing with the, the situation in New York City. But this is why we recommend appropriate equipment, practices, and procedures in the shop to mitigate the risk. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a diagram. This, this uh, I've, I've borrowed from Underwriters Labs. The, the scientific arm of Underwriters Labs has developed this chart to illustrate what are the causes of a lithium ion battery fire. And you can see that they, they fall into five groups. Uh, design and manufacturing is clearly very important. As, as I've alluded, a quality battery pack uh, utilizes high quality cells. It uses a good battery management system, a capable battery management system. It's proper, properly programmed to, to control the pack such that it's always operating within, within its, its uh, safe limits and whatnot. Uh, clearly, there are electrical issues associated with it. Um, you know, we can't over discharge a pack. We can't overcharge a pack. Uh, there have to be safeties built into the pack and that's the, the function of the battery management system. There's external factors, environmental factors associated with overheating it or freezing it um, or, or immersing it in water. You know, these are very important uh, to understand because knowing these um, failure methodologies or these failure modalities we can proactively address them to make sure that they do not occur either during manufacture, production, distribution, sale, and use of the products. Uh, mechanical issues. The, 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 the concept here that UL was offering is the fact that it's basically a short circuit that leads to a lithium ion battery fire. And there are two categories of short circuits. One can be an internal short circuit in the battery cell itself. And that occurs if the separator that separates the anode and the cathode uh, fails in some, in some respect. That is, <clears throat> that is addressed by the quality of the separator and the quality of manufacturing. Um, but then there are external factors that can cause a short circuit. A short circuit, I'm sure everybody appreciates, is, is when uh, you know, the positive and negative terminals of an electrical energy storage device are uh, uh, directly connected, um, setting up an instantaneous release of all of the energy contained within that cell. So uh, one might suggest, though, that 
uh, you know, uh, two of the two of the five elements here are basic related to manufacturing and design. Um, the, obviously, from the manufacturing perspective, you got to use good, good components. From the electrical perspective, you need to source proper uh, charging um, methodologies and, and proper charging controls. And as dealers and consumers, we might think to ourselves, well, we can't really control that. But in that particular case, I would beg to disagree because we can control it. And how do we control it? We control it by purchasing our e-bike inventory from reputable e-bike suppliers. Reputable e-bike suppliers will ensure that the manufacture and programming of these lithium ion batteries is done correctly. And it's done such that it complies with UL 2849, which is the safety standard that UL has propagated, again, developed in conjunction with the industry to make sure that in fact, the electrical system, including the battery, very importantly, including the battery under uh, standards promulgated under a, another UL standard called 2271. But if we buy and distribute and sell to our customers quality products that have been certified to the safety standards, the chances of this ever happening are minuscule. And that's really important to know. So whereas you might think you can't affect the, 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 the quality of the manufacturer, you can, by making sure that you buy a quality product and you do that by purchasing it from reputable suppliers. The other thing though, that's important, and we've been making a case to this uh, over the past several months is that you need to request not only documentation of the fact that the product complies with the standards, you need to request copies of the vendor's product liability insurance policies. These things can fail under certain circumstances. And if they do, you need to protect yourself. You need to protect your shop to make sure that there's a, a financial resource available if in fact there is a, is a failure. So um, there was a, a webinar not long ago featuring Scott Chapin. Scott comes from the insurance industry and uh, obviously he's gonna promote uh, the importance of making sure that, that you are covered by appropriate insurance policies in the unfortunate event that something does occur. We want to make sure, we want you to make sure that your vendors participate in a recycling program. Right now, the recycling program of choice in the bicycle industry is managed by Called Recycle. This is a Canadian company that's collaborated very closely with People for Bikes. Um, I've been very impressed with the level of expertise and insight that Call to Recycle has with respect to lithium ion battery technologies. They have developed an excellent program. Uh, for making sure that end of life battery packs and potentially defective battery packs are taken out of circulation in a safe manner. Uh, they've provided training, they're providing equipment necessary to deal with lithium ion batteries in your shop once a battery pack is returned from a consumer because it's at the end of its life. Um, and the same thing holds true if, if you have a battery pack that you suspect they have an 800 number that you can call. They will send out a drum packed with a special agent that will uh, control a fire in the event that it ever occurs. And the drum has been certified by FedEx as being safe for transport. So um, urge, your, urge your suppliers to participate in this called recycle program. So we have this uh, extra capability to take uh, old and, and defective battery packs out of circulation. And finally, you need to ed educate your customers. Um, we had a webinar, I believe the last webinar we did on this subject was what should you advise your customers relative to the care and use of their e-bike battery packs? Because uh, uh, clearly once the pack leaves your control and into the hands of your customers, it's still our responsibility to make sure that they're doing what they need to mitigate the risk. And, and it's, uh, you know, awareness of these issues is critically important, especially in the minds of your, your customers, because uh, uh, we want to avoid a potential tragedy that would occur if one of these packs failed in, in, the, in their garage, as it were. These are, the, these are the requirements, or not requirements, these are the recommendations that we've made over the course of the past year relative to, to what you should be, do, be doing in the shop. Um, we advise that you store all the battery packs that you have in the fire-resistant cabinet. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute about a modification to that based on conversations that we've had with FDNY. Uh, we recommend that you do not pre-charge battery packs, only charge a pack as it's being prepared, as the bike is being prepared for delivery. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. I mean, uh, catastrophic failure is the inadvertent release of the energy stored within the battery pack. If there's not much energy in the pack, if for whatever reason it does fail, the, the results are going to be significantly less dramatic than they would be as if it was a fully charged pack. You can use the analogy of a gas tank. You know, I'd rather deal with a half a gallon of gasoline burning than 40 gallons of gasoline burning. 
And the same holds true with respect to battery packs. We recommend that you charge the battery packs on a wire rack. Uh, we've shown pictures of that in, in, in the past. The wire rack makes sense because it's not flammable. Uh, we recommend that it be on wheels. You can buy these from Costco. You can buy them from uh, McMaster Car. Um, you know, you zip tie a charger, the proper charger, uh, to the battery case for the particular battery that you're, that you're charging. And, and in the event of an issue, you can wheel that thing to a safe place if necessary. Uh, we also advise that you never charge a battery pack inside the storage container because if, if it fails during charging, uh, it's going to present a risk to the rest of the packs that are stored in there. And then we're back into the same conversation about how much energy is in that cabinet. So you want to minimize that. This may be the most important one. I probably should have highlighted it. Make sure that you only use the charger that was supplied by the, with the e-bike. Now, <clears throat> it, it's logical that you would have extra chargers for each different type of battery that you have. Uh, this doesn't mean you've got to take the charger out of the box with the bike and, and, and use it. You can have a, a generic charger, but it's the, the charger that's specified for use with that e-bike. You can go back to the vendor and buy a couple extra chargers and put them on the rack so that you're using the right charger um, with, with that particular battery. The, the issue here clearly is, is that uh, the, the charger, the battery management system contained within the battery pack have to be matched. Um, if a battery charger is, isn't uh, appropriate, charges at too high of an amperage, um, doesn't shut off at the proper cutoff point, uh, it can stress the battery pack and potentially leave, lead to a, a failure. Uh, I, I've said this a thousand times, never charge a battery pack unattended. You know, never, never close your shop with batteries on a charger because if it fails, there's, there's nobody there to, to intervene before a, a significant damage can occur. Um, unplug every battery pack, turn off the charger associated with it, put the pack back in the cabinet before you close the shop for the night. Uh, when you're charging batteries, it's important to turn off and disconnect the charger as soon as the charger indicates that the battery is fully charged. When that green LED comes on, okay, it's charged. Turn it off, unplug it, put it back in the cabinet. Um, a lot of times, you know, people, I do it myself. I, I plug my cell phone in before I go to bed and put it on the nightstand and leave it on all night. Well, the energy contained in a cell phone battery is significantly less than the energy contained in an e-bike battery. So that's not as horrible as it might sound, but it's also not as safe as it, it should be. But uh, you never want to charge a battery pack unattended and you never want to leave it on a charger um, for extended periods of time. Uh, never open or tamper with a lithium ion battery pack. There's no use of serviceable components in there. Opening a pack subjects it to a possible short circuit. If you draw, I've, I've done it myself. I've opened a pack because I was, I was a technician charged with servicing these battery packs. You open a pack, you drop a screwdriver or something in there, you, you, that screwdriver comes in contact with the wrong terminals and you've got a resultant fire. It, it's, it, there, there's nothing you can do inside a battery pack to fix it, to tune it, to do anything. So you never open a lithium ion battery pack, leave that to the experts. We always advise that you charge battery packs in an area with a smoking, uh, working smoke detector. That only makes sense. I mean, you know, clearly if you're not watching the battery pack and something happens, the fire, um, the smoke detector will alert you to that fact such that you can, you can take action. Um, I also recommend that you have a fire extinguisher handy. Now I, I will state, and I've stated before, you cannot put out a lithium ion battery pack. It will not extinguish. Uh, you oftentimes hear stories in the news about firefighters trying to extinguish a car battery. Uh, it just doesn't happen. You can, you can damp it down to a point. You can, you can prevent cell to cell uh, propagation, but you can't put it out. The fire extinguisher is there in the event something adjacent to the battery catches fire. You can put it out quickly. Uh, this next point is, is been a hot topic of conversation. Uh, I, I hear questions from a lot of dealers. You know, I've got uh, people bringing their e-bikes in for service. Should I accept the bike with the battery pack? I mean, if somebody brings in an e-bike for you to change a tire, um, should I tell the customer to take the battery pack with them? My advice is yes. If you don't know the pedigree of that battery pack, um, it, it, you can't trust it. So I would not accept any lithium ion battery packs for service or storage in my shop. Um, if you have a customer that's purchased the bike from you and they bring it in, you know, that's a little bit of a different situation because they're expecting you to, to uh, stand behind the product that you've sold. 
But if the issue that they're bringing the bike in for service doesn't pertain to the electrical system and doesn't require having the battery on hand to test the, the uh, uh, eff efficacy of the repair, then have them take the battery pack back home. You don't need that in your shop. And then finally, uh, as we've said, recycling end of life battery packs and compromised battery packs is very important. And here again, I'll refer to Call to Recycle as being a very capable agency uh, for that particular service. More points that we've made in the past, you know, for extended periods of non-use, and this is probably more important for customers than it is for the store, uh, but you, you want to advise your customer that they store the e-bike battery pack in a clean, dry environment, uh, not outdoors or in a cold garage. You don't want to freeze a battery pack uh, away from flammable materials. Uh, it should be stored at, at reasonable temperatures between 40 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, that, that just makes sense. Um, as I say, don't freeze a battery pack and never attempt to charge a cold battery pack. If, if, the, if the pack has been stored in a cold place, um, it reacts differently under, under charging current than it would if it was charged at room temperature. So you never wanna to attempt to charge a cold pack. And then battery packs, again, are best stored at a diminished capacity. 60% um, is a good place to go. One, one possible issue with, with uh, lithium ion batteries, is you never want to deeply discharge a lithium ion battery. Every battery pack has internal resistance. Every battery pack will discharge very slowly over time, even if it's not in service. So you don't want to store it completely drained because then the internal resistance will bring it down below a point at which it becomes dangerous. So you want to store it at a reduced capacity, but not zero. And then if it's going to be stored for a long period of time, it makes sense to, to elevate the charge uh, to address that internal resistance, that self-discharge uh, periodically just to prevent the, the deep discharge that can damage the battery pack. Um, here again, I, I can't say this enough, battery packs need to be recycled. When they reach the end of life, uh, work with a recycler, being, be it uh, called a recycle or another recycling agency. Uh, it's against the law to dispose of a lithium ion battery. Um, uh, many, many uh, landfill fires have occurred because people irresponsibly dispose of a lithium ion battery. Uh, while it's in that landfill, uh, it, it can be immersed in water, it can be short circuited. Um, lithium ion battery fires in landfills are a significant issue, plus you don't want those chemicals leaching into the groundwater. Um, always, always, always replace a battery pack with a pack from the original equipment supplier. Uh, here again, replacing packs from third parties, replacing refurbished packs, um, re replacing with a DIY pack. I mean, there's actually a book cir circulating around advising people how to build your do-it-yourself uh, lithium ion battery pack. That's insanity, in my opinion. So you always want to make sure that you're replacing a pack with a like pack that's been matched to the system such that it's not going to present um, uh, an issue. And as I say, never use a refurbished pack, never use a pack from a from a third party supplier. If the battery has been dropped or damaged or immersed in water as what happened in Florida, do not attempt to charge it. Again, store it in a safe place, prefer preferably outdoors, because at that point, the likelihood of its failing catastrophically is very high. Recycle it as soon as possible. Uh, and here again, as we talked earlier, uh, Call to Recycle offers uh, facilities and equipment to safely dispose of those packs and you should certainly avail yourself of those services when the time comes. Uh, this is something that, that I need to modify some of the advice that I've given earlier. Uh, in, in past webinars, uh, I've suggested that in all likelihood, a pack fails slowly. And, and that's correct in the sense that if a single cell, if, if there's a single defective cell in a battery pack uh, that fails, it will take some time for that cell uh, overheat to propagate to additional cells that are contained in the pack. And that's true. And my recommendation was if you, sell, if you see a pack that is acting funny, if it's smoking or if, or if you hear odd noises come, out, come from it, get it outside. I've also suggested that you want to put it in a bath of water. Uh, and that, that in fact is still true. But it's likely that under certain failure modes, that pack will virtually explode. I mean, it, it fails quickly quickly. And, and this was something that was uh, discussed at great length at the uh
Hi, everyone. It looks like Mike has lost the feed. We are working on getting him back on now. Mike, if you can hear me, you are muted. Uh, if you can unmute, apologies, everyone. Zoom has caused a little glitch, but we are fixing it now. Mike, the presentation has been excellent so far. Lots of great information. We really appreciate it. And it looks like Mike maybe dropped off and is coming back on possibly. Just one second here. How about now? There we go, we're back. Thank you, Mike. So uh, you dropped Sorry off. Sorry about that. Just a little bit, maybe if you want to start on the slide that you were on, I can't okay. exactly where you okay, are. Hold on a minute. Thank you everyone for your I, patience. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, let me get back to my control here. Okay, I think we were right here. I, I would say this is a good spot, yep. Okay, what I was saying everybody is, is that uh, earlier advice that I'd, I've given is, related to the fact that if you think a battery pack is failing, get it outside or, or get it in a tub of water. Uh, but the issue that was made clear during the New York City Fire Department symposium was is these things can fail explosively. And under those circumstances, I'm modifying my advice by saying, if you see a pack emitting smoke or flame, uh, evacuate, evacuate quickly and call 911 because the gases that are generated by a lithium ion battery pack in failure mode are very, very dangerous. They, it's a, it's a, it's emit, emitting hydrogen fluoride gas. It's extremely toxic. It's extremely damaging to the respiratory system. You need to get out and get away as quickly as possible and get the pros involved. Um, the good news is, is, you know, this sounds, this sounds terrible. And and I'll, I'll conclude in a few minutes with a statement to the effect that the likelihood of this ever happening is minuscule. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one other advisory that I wanna modify a little bit. Uh, we suggested, and I've reiterated earlier to, to store all of your battery packs in a fire resistant cabinet. And we actually recommended this particular style of cabinet. And the idea there was is if a battery pack fails while it's stored in the cabinet, the cabinet will con constrain the fire uh, until the professionals can get there. I had long conversations with uh, the actual firefighters at New York Fire City, uh, New York City Fire Department about this issue, and they discouraged the use of a cabinet of this nature. And I asked why, and, and the one guy looked at me and he said, who's going to open it? If, if there's a fire going on in that cabinet, who's going to open it? Because, you know, the, the, it's a hot fire, it's raging inside, cells are being ejected. They're, they're essentially saying that, no, that, that's not a good idea. But I, 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 I guess I disagree to the extent that um, this is my point. Um, you, you need you need to do something. There's there's no other option currently available. Um, and I can report that we're working with companies that are developing appropriate cabinets for the storage of these batteries that will constrain a fire and it will vent the smoke to the outside. And, and in some cases, they're actually incorporating uh, gas scrubbers to reduce the the hazardous components of the gases that are generated. But they're not available yet. So in the meantime, my contention is, is that something is better than nothing. So keeping in a cabinet like this is going to slow it down. And then you can let the, the pros worry about opening the cabinet once they get there to address the issue. So uh, until such time as, as uh, better cabinets are available, my recommendation is you continue to use this. I've got one in my garage and I keep every lithium ion battery in my shop in that cabinet. Um, if there's a problem, it's con contained until such time as the pros can get there to deal with it. So uh, we will keep you apprised on these developments. We're very, working very closely with a company that's, that's developing these cabinets. There's currently an issue associated with what the cabinets will cost. Uh, clearly, you, you, know, you, you, need, you need to have an affordable solution for your shop. Uh, they're aware of that, and we will continue to actively represent the industry with respect to the development of storage cabinets that are appropriate for bike shop use. Stay tuned for further details on that. I guess this, this is what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, we don't, what we wanna do is we wanna uh, counter the, the, the impression that e-bikes that e are dangerous because of their battery packs. 
the chances that you're gonna see one of these things fail are minuscule. And the chances are even reduced further to almost zero by, by purchasing, selling, maintaining, storing quality packs, using the proper procedures uh, to ensure that, to ensure that, that uh, uh, you're, you're minimizing the, the, the possibility of any sort of, of problems associated with these. But again, the chances are not zero. Um, they do fail. They do fail from time to time, even when you've done everything right. So in that, in that regard, we feel that it's important that you adhere to these guidelines. Um, you take the precautions necessary so that in the unlikely events something happens, uh, the ramifications are going to be contained. And um, I, I guess I'll close on that. I, I, I certainly want to be uh, accessible. Um, as I say, we're very proactive with this issue. We, uh, we're, we're talking to experts in the field, both from the supply side as well as from the distribution side and, and the uh, firefighting side. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to be your go-to source for information and expertise as to how you can deal with this in the shop. Um, should you consider getting out of the business? Hell no. Uh, this is a wonderful product that's gonna be uh, profitable for all of us in the future but we just have to be careful. And, and again, I, it's a well-worn analogy. Uh, gasoline is significantly more dangerous than lithium ion battery in terms of the energy density contained therein. We have learned how to manage gasoline as an energy source. We, we know how to store it. We know how to use it. We know how to deal with it safely. Do battery or gasoline fires still occur in cars? Yes. Uh, in fact, with a lot greater frequency than they do in electric cars, even, even considering the, the number of units in service, but the point is, is technology is evolving. Uh, our, our, our products are evolving. Our safety systems are evolving. Uh, this is a viable alternative in the transportation infrastructure. Uh, we need to be proud of the fact that we're, we're leaders in this industry and uh, we're doing some great things for civilization. Uh, we just need to be careful because we have a, a very high energy density storage media that we have to treat with care and respect. So on that basis, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you for participation. And if we have time for questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer any that I can. Thank you so much, Mike. This has been really information heavy and amazing. Um, we do have some questions. So if you don't mind getting right into it. Not at all. All right, perfect. Um, first up we have, can burnt packs be ID'd? No, <laughs> that, that, that's a very good question. And, and it's a source of frustration. Um, th these, these fires are, are so violent. Um, there is very leftover. I, I was tempted to include a lot of photographs of, of burned battery packs. Um, I, I think that's a little bit, bit of sensationalism, so I didn't. Uh, but there's usually very little left over, and what is left over is pretty much unrecognizable. And that's problematic, too, from a forensic standpoint. Um, it would be great if we could go in and say, oh, that was a battery from an ABC company, and we know that they burn, or that, that was a battery pack. And, and, and this is a real-life experience. Um, I used to work for a, a, a company. I was a consultant for a company in Taiwan that manufactured battery packs for high-quality bikes. I mean, we're talking six, $7,000 bikes. They had some issues. This was this was years ago before a lot of the uh, improvements that have transpired have occurred. Um, and I was charged with investigating several fires associated with these battery packs. And when you go into the scene and you look at what's left over, I mean, it's basically ash and burnt aluminum cans. There's there's very little that you can do in terms of tracing it back. That's why I want to be proactive with this issue in, in New York City and go get sample packs before they burn so that we can identify the, the manufacturers and we can test the quality of the battery pack and the quality of the construction and the quality of the cells, everything else. Because once it burns, it, it's gone. Um, next question. I appreciate the distinction between quality and low quality packs. Is drawing a line practical? How do we ensure that we only bring an in inventory with quality packs? Certification to the standard. Um, this, this, is, this is a big issue in the industry because it, it's not trivial, trivial and it's not cheap to have these packs certified. And in fact, there are certification requirements that are mandated. For example, uh, if you want to, if, if you're a, if you're an e-bike purveyor, for example, you're a manufacturer, you're importing e-bikes, uh, you have to 
submit your battery packs for UN testing. There's a UN requirement that must, the, the pack must comply with the UN requirements before you can put it on a boat to bring it over. There's another requirement that the shipping industry imposes. Um, I, quite frankly, this is one of the investigative tracks that we want to take vis-a-vis -vis the battery packs that are failing in New York City. Do they comply with those requirements? Because it's the law that they must to be shipped. If that's the case, then why are they failing? So there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions right now relative to the situation, which is why we're trying to be as proactive and aggressive at getting to the bottom of this. And you know, I, I, again, I, I, it frustrates me because the, the, the issue in New York City is, is dire. People are dying. Why can't we get more cooperation to get in there and understand what's going on? Um, but generally speaking, if I were an e-bike dealer, I would only buy my product for sale through my store from a company that can certify compliance to these UL standards, which are still voluntary. They're still, they're still voluntary. They're not mandatory. So um, we're, we're having that discussion on a regular basis. I sit on the e-bike subcommittee for people for bikes, and, and I, I try to make this case every chance I get. Thank you. Um, how can a consumer or dealer know when a given battery is at the end of its life? It, it'll, it'll be a noticeable reduction in range. Um, there, the industry uses a, a, a standard or a, a metric, if you will, uh, to uh, determine whether or not a battery pack has reached the end of its useful life. And basically, it says that when you get to 75 or 80 percent remaining capacity for all extents and purposes, that battery packs at the end of its life. And it's reflected in terms, I mean, if, if your new bike will take you on a ride of X number of miles, and over time, you notice that that mileage capability is, is degrading. It's because the battery pack's reaching the end of its useful life. Battery packs have cycle lives. Now, one of the advantages to lithium ion batteries is their cycle life is much higher than anything else that's currently available. So the lithium pack will last longer, but over time it will lose capacity and you'll notice it in terms of reduction primarily in range. Thank you. Um, I do want to address the next question, which is, does MBDA have a best practices brochure that shops could download and have printed out to hand to consumers with new sales? I know, Mike, you did provide us something like that. It is available. I can send out that link to that document um, as a follow-up email to this. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, there, there are two documents. One, one there are guidelines for the retailer and the other are guidelines for the consumer. And I, I would recommend having both on hand so that A, you know what to do in the shop and B, you can hand to your customer a, a sheet. One of the, one of the issues, and, and we're working on this as well at NBDA, one of the issues currently is in getting the appropriate information in an owner's manual that's handed to the customer when they buy the bike. Uh, there, there's a working group uh, associated with uh, People for Bikes on uh, a new e-bike owner's manual um, uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of the working group associated with the battery packs. We currently have submissions from all of the uh, members relative to what they see as a need in the battery pack. In fact, we've got a, we've got a meeting next week uh, to discuss uh, what and how we will integrate uh, these instructions into an owner's manual so that we're giving consistent advice to customers. But in the meantime, you can use the publication that we provide at NBDA uh, to give to customers as to what they should do to make sure that their packs are, are safe and reliable over the course of their life. Perfect. Um, next question, by keeping multiple packs in the same cabinet, aren't you compounding the degree of combustion should one pack fail? Yes, definitely. And, and that's what I alluded to. That was one of the things that the uh, FDNY was objecting to. You put a bunch of packs in there. If one cooks off, sooner or later they're all going to cook off. But right now we don't have an alternative. Um, you know, my contention is is contain the fire, even it get if it gets to be of of significant magnitude due, due to the amount of fuel in the cabinet, uh, as opposed to having a pack on a shelf, setting the rest of the. I, I'd rather it. I'd rather it set adjacent batteries in the cabinet on fire, than a failing battery pack set the store on fire. So. And that's why the importance of this exercise to develop appropriate storage containers is so important. Um, uh, when Heather and I were at the uh, symposium, uh, a company was showing their uh, uh, storage unit. And basically it was, it was a, a big heavy gauge steel shelf with dividers between compartments. And you would put a battery pack into each 
compartment such that if it failed, the steel dividers separating the packs would prevent propagation. But the issue was it was only closed off with a curtain. And that curtain, it was a fire resistant curtain and it would prevent the fire from propagating out of the cabinet, but it didn't constrain the gas. So if a pack cooked off, the gas could easily escape from that cabinet and, and, and infiltrate the environment uh, adjacent to it. So um, the packs that we're currently, or the storage containers that we're currently working on, uh, I shouldn't say we, it's the company that we're working with, uh, actually have a venting system that the, the, the storage unit is closed off and the vent actually extracts the gas. And in some case, they, they run the gas through a scrubber to remove the harmful elements before venting it to the outside. Uh, but the, the important thing is it gets the gas out of the cabinet and out of the environment around the cabinet. But cost is an issue and availability is an issue. So um, that's why I say stay tuned for further details because we we're working closely with this company in the hopes of developing a pack that's suitable for use at uh, in a bike shop. And, and I might add this, this company is planning on joining us at the upcoming CABDA shows in, in um, the first quarter of next year. Uh, they will have cabinets on display so that you can see the direction that we're going and they will have representatives there to talk about the technology and what they're doing. As I say, we've got a significant hurdle to, to broach associated with the cost of these things because we don't want to offer you a storage cabinet that costs $50,000 because, you know, what bike shop can afford that. So, so that, that is definitely a, an area of, of intense work. Um, but again, you know, as, as I say, the technology in all aspects is evolving. And, and as we continue to diminish the likelihood of these fires ever happening, the importance of the storage cabinets will, will reduce as well. All right, a couple more questions here. Um, you've said that we should only work on bikes that are, and batteries that are UL certified. How do we figure out what batteries are and are not UL certified? Uh, talk to your suppliers. And again, most suppliers right now are going to say, no, we don't test to that. And you're going to say, well, we want you to test to that because to have confidence in these products, we need to be assured that they comply with appropriate standards. So that's, that's an issue. And, and Heather, as you know, that's, that's something that we've had a lot of conversations with our colleagues in the industry about, and there's a lot of pushback associated with the cost of getting everything certified. The argument that we make is that the cost of a fire significantly outweighs the cost of a certification effort. Thank you. Um, is it better to keep packs on new bikes or in a storage cabinet, like uh, new e-bikes that come in a box? I, I have... <laughs> I won't mention the brand, uh, but a, a very high-end electric bike company shipped a 20-foot container full of lithium-ion battery packs. Brands bank a new lithium-ion battery packs from their, from their factory. One of them failed in transit. The whole container burned out. Um, so it's the, the, the chances are minuscule, and you're going to get tired of hearing me say this, but the ramifications are so severe that it makes sense to store everything in sort of some sort of a constraint. Um, as I say, N NY or FDNY doesn't like the cabinet I've recommended, but I don't know of any other option. And I do believe that getting it someplace where it can be contained for a reasonable period of time until, until the fire department gets there is, is a good idea. So my recommendation is put everything, you know, and, I, and I'll use the example, um, uh, Curry Technologies back before they became acquired, um, they had a, a major, a large warehouse uh, in in um, uh, in California. I don't remember the, the Simi Valley, Simi Valley, California. And, and I did a lot of work at that facility. They actually purchased a forty foot container, forty foot shipping container, and they dragged it into their warehouse and they stored every lithium ion battery in the in the warehouse in that container. Uh, again, if if one cooks off, they're all going to cook off, but at least it's constrained. Pedigo. Pedigo stores all of the battery packs that they buy for their electric bikes in containers away from away from the warehouse. It's not away from the warehouse; it's the back of the warehouse. But the point is, is is it's just good practice. Even if you're buying the best pack in the world, you know, I, I like to reference the fact that literally billions of these cells are being manufactured worldwide to power our electric devices, because the advantages of lithium ion battery chemistry are so significant in terms of energy density, cycle life, everything else. They're used in everything from cars to computers to watches and cell phones. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But the point is, is, is um, uh, they contain so much energy 
that if that if if it fails, it, it's it's a it's a catastrophe. And and when you're literally manufacturing billions of cells, even at the tiniest failure rate, you've still got a sizable quantity of cells that may fail in the field. And and so you need to be prepared for it. And again, it, I'll, I'll I'll say it again, um, the the likelihood is infinitesimal, but the magnitude of the ramifications is great. So. A little extra precaution, I think, is justified. Two more questions here. Um, does that best practice apply to batteries that are on e-bikes on the sales floor? Should they be taking the batteries off of the e-bikes on the sales floor at night? Very good question. And, and we've talked about that. And, and this has an, uh, an adjunct to it. My recommendation is yes. Minimally, don't charge them. <laughs> you know, keep away from a charger. But our recommendation is yes, take them off the bike and store them in a fireproof container, just in case. Chances are nothing's going to happen, but just in case. What do you do when you've got a battery pack that's got a, a, a that's integrated in the down tube of a pack that is cumbersome to remove? Um, remember the uh, Faraday bikes. Faraday bikes had a very small battery pack inside the tube that required disassembly of the bottom bracket to get the battery pack out. Do you, do you take the battery pack out every night? No, that's not, that's not feasible. So what you do in that particular instance, it's my recommendation, is you isolate those, those bikes in an area of the shop away from flammable material. And assuming that you've got a network fire or smoke detector in the shop, if anything did happen, you'd be alerted to it. And as long as the pack isn't adjacent to stored cardboard or, or cleaning chemicals or whatnot, um, you know, you'll, you'll be buying yourself a, an element of time before the fire department gets there to put it out. So there's definitely practicalities associated with this. And, and as I say, if, if the pack uh, can't be removed without significant effort, you know, you're not gonna do that every, every night before you close the shop. So you, you isolate those bikes someplace where if something does happen, the, the damage is gonna be minimized. Um, but if you can take the pack off easily, store it in the cabinet. Thank you. And you must have uh, known what was coming next because the last question was going to be on that, um, the e-bikes that don't have the removable batteries. What do you do in that case? So yeah. your recommendation is keep them on one side of the shop. Yeah. You know, like I say, don't, don't store them next to, you know, bikes in cardboard boxes. Um, keep them as far away from other flammable materials as you can, uh, just in case. Chances of something happening is small, but just in case. Perfect. That's again, you know, it, it all boils it all boils down to buying quality product that's been certified to the safety standards. The likelihood is almost zero. Unfortunately, it's not zero yet. When we get to solid state batteries, it'll be significantly better and there'll be significantly less concern. <clears throat> there is a downside to solid state batteries that's constantly pointed out to me, and that's the fact that solid state batteries will have even higher energy density than the current uh, liquid electrolyte uh, lithium ion batteries. And, you know, more energy mean, you know, more energy released in an uncontrolled fashion means a bigger problem. But if, if, uh, if there's not that medium, if there's not that flammable low flashpoint medium to propagate the fire, it's got to be a better scenario. So the, the issue is, is, is uh, from, from what I read and from my perspective, lithium, solid state lithium ion batteries are probably three to five years out. Other people disagree with me. They're, they're saying that the manufacturing challenges associated with this technology are such that it's going to be 10 years before solid state batteries are available, whatever. The point is, is there, that the industry is working hard to address this. But in the meantime, we need to be cognizant, we need to be aware, and we need to be careful. Thank you so much, Mike. If anybody that's watching the recording that wasn't able to be here today has any questions, please email uh, compliancy team at nbda.com or Mike had his personal email up on the screen earlier and we will make sure to get all of your questions answered. So thank you again for being here and for all the information, Mike. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Heather, anytime. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.